I, I, I really do believe that too many of us have got ourselves caught up in this idea that, hey, well, we, we can't cook, or we're too busy to cook, or, or we're shit. I don't know how to cook. Anybody here who doesn't know how to cook? Anybody who's willing to put their hand up in this forum with this... With, you, know, <laughs> you know, I'll pick on the guys in the back of the room because they, they can't get at me, but, but really, if you're, if you're here and you think you can't cook, you know, you need to come up here so Jonathan can slap you upside on the one head and I'll slap you upside the other. What is it like to write a really, really mean book which has no hint of moral redemption in it? And the answer is a lot of fun. <laughs> I've always been made uncomfortable by uh, serious books that offer moral redemption too easily. Um, and I've also been very uncomfortable with novelists who confuse themselves with the narrator. Um, I really believe that the, the narrator has to dis the novelist has to disappear. No, you have to disappear inside. But you shouldn't be in any real way there. The, you know, the narrator and the characters are in charge. And, uh, and I'm the kind of person who actually doesn't write anything, but certainly not novels, until they've been inside me so long that they come out almost fully formed. And I might do seven to ten drafts fixing it up, but it comes out, they come out alive. So you have very limited control over them by the time you vomit the thing out. You know, there's not that much you can do. You can't make them do something they don't want to do because it's not believable, it's not true. You know, I read the New Yorker review recently of uh, Midnight's Children, and they said, they described it as a continent finding its voice at last in this post-colonial world. When you read it, though, it is so epic. What made you think, boy, this would make a great film? It seems unwieldy in some ways. Maybe I'm the stuck of punishment. <laughs> I just loved it. I mean, it, it never, it never even struck me for a moment that it was unwieldy or, um, or it, it had too many storylines. It, it, uh, the storyline I really wanted to focus on was uh, Celine's coming of age story and uh, India coming of age. So that that narrative flow was very clear to me right from the beginning. And it was interesting. We were at the Telluride Film Festival and Salman, David, and myself were walking down the street and we heard somebody say, did you see Midnight's Children? It's Forrest Gump with Indians. Uh, I should point out that I'm basically here to announce officially that reading crime fiction is better than sex. It is! No, this is official, they did. They did a, a survey in a women's magazine back in the UK, and they interviewed you know hundreds of women aged between kind of you know 20 and 80, and a significant percentage of these women said that reading crime fiction was better than shopping, eating, and sex. Now, as at any entry event, the women in this room probably outnumber the men by about 10 to 1. So I think I'm on fairly safe ground in going, way to go, ladies. It's a bit of nonsense, it's a stupid survey. That's, I, couldn't, I can't honestly tell you that reading this is, is going to be better than sex. I can guarantee you that it will last a downside longer. <laughs> I was in the bathtub on my mother's phone, announcing my sister's pregnancy. It's a miracle, my mother said. Dina Goldstein was a woman who had me in her teens, and she believed in early starts. Rising at 5 a.m. to dust ceiling fans and fireplace logs, she was sprung from the mold of shtetl women past who cleaned, loved, and worried with great ferocity. Which is to say, she'd been waiting to be a grandmother since her 20s. <laughs> and which is also to say, with my sister's good news, the pressure was off me. <laughs> On the blessed day of the baby's arrival, we all meet up in my sister's hospital room. We don't get together as often as we should. Get-togethers are usually reserved for funerals and the Jewish high holidays, both equally mirthless affairs. <laughs> but just now, I've never been in a room where so many members of my family are actually this happy at once. Usually, maybe one or two are happy at any given time. <laughs> while the rest hold down the fort, remaining dyspeptic, dysphoric, or 
boldly is struggling to maintain a nice, even level of dispiritedness. <laughs> Do you remember, first of all, I mean, in case there's anybody, you know, under 30 here, we used to, we used to like, do you remember there used to be cassette decks and then you would tape something off the radio, <laughs> right? And, yeah, yeah, don't clap too hard, because it's sort of humiliating. Like, it's like, you would have the two buttons ready to go, you know, in case the song came on, and you would run over, and you'd be like, on the other side of the room, and you'd have to dash over there. You know, hit the, and so like, there's an entire generation of people who don't know the first 10 seconds of songs. My book is, uh, if I had to talk about it thematically, I guess it, I'd say it's about endings, and it's about loss, and it's about mourning, but it's also about love. Joyce always came home from the hospice with a list of names in her pocket, even though she had found that names didn't matter much there. From week to week, the names changed as they were expected to, even though the room numbers, one to eight, stayed the same. Old-fashioned names ready to come into popular circulation again. Dorothy, Grace, Daniel, Sarah, Isaiah, Daisy, Joe, shifting from generation to generation as if carried on the wind. Today, two candles remained lit by the nurse's station, as they were for 24 hours after her death, and two new patients had already arrived by ambulance. The flames flickered each time someone passed by. Now, from time immemorial, people have had a sense of their deep connection with stars, in the, in the sense of heat and light. So we know that essentially, we eat stars at a certain level. And when we're eating plants, we're eating plants that have converted sunlight into food, and that all life on Earth ultimately depends on the heat and light from stars. So we have that energetic sense of connection from stars. But in the Stardust Revolution, in the last 50 years of, uh, of science, we've realized we don't just have an energetic connection with stars, we have a fundamental physical connection with stars. We are physically connected to stars. The title for this session is uh, The Ever-Present Past, which of course is music to my ears because I'm a non-fiction history writer and I'm constantly trying to explain to people that actually the past does matter because it's not past. One of my favorite, favorite quotations, a much overused quotation, is from William Faulkner who said, History is not dead, in fact it's not even past, it's all around us. And that reverberates through every work of fiction, whether or not the author realizes it, whether or not it's actually labeled historical fiction. Like if we want to talk about engagement, it's not enough just to you know, sit at night and go onto someone's website and read about it, and then have an opinion. We have to figure out what that means, and I think it should be a practice. Like, I talk in my book, but, you know, we wouldn't let someone else decide where our kids are going to school, you know? Why are we letting someone else just decide about what their future looks like? And so, actually, civic engagement means volunteering. You know, it means going and spending, you know, and treating it like a job. You know, I do a couple hours a week for other groups, um, and it just, that's, you know, it's a commitment. It's a volunteer commitment, and then it's part of your life. And I think that's really important, rather than just kind of sitting back and maybe writing a check and expecting someone else to do it. I, I said very clearly that I believe we ought to have reacted forcefully, and we ought to still react forcefully when terrorist organizations threaten the stability of our world, and I believe we should. I am very much concerned that the war on terror has, uh, has um, uh, created damage to our civil society that will not soon be repaired. It is a mistake, to my mind, to spend more time criticizing in heartache over the fact that President Obama has kept Guantanamo open 
than one does generally in public discourse or in the public at large, worrying about the networks in Pakistan that can threaten, still threaten, that region, the Maghreb, and the whole world. The book really um, uh, is a very personal project for me. I've worked at Human Rights Watch for 15 years, and in that time we have seen great advances, great strides forward for women's rights around the world, for example, on uh, domestic violence legislation, on women entering the workforce, advances for girls to uh, an education. But in other parts of the world, I think we have to concede that women are losing ground, uh, that rights for girls are not being upheld. So I wanted, this is why we've done this project. It's, it's a very personal project, uh, but I think it also showcases the voices of women's rights activists and advocates around the world. They are themselves activists and advocates, agents of change, and that that's why, although many of the stories in this book are quite tough, I want to I want to advertise that, but they also, to me, represent the best hope for change. Oh! What? What is it? I felt something. A, a kick. The baby kick. Yeah, I think it was a kick. I'm pretty sure it was. Oh my god. What's your hand here? Do you feel anything? No, not yet. I'm pretty sure I felt something. Just a little push right there. Push or kick? A movement, like a quick movement. Put your ear on it, Lily. Festival. I'm Lloyd Robertson. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>